Hello and welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast is where we go through each movie, and I guess by now everything else, made by Studio Ghibli in release order, and we discuss our analysis and research findings. Today we're having a bit of an odd one out, and I guess so far we've only covered movies, and with Ocean Waves 1 movie length special and the other only other exception was uh, uh on your mark which of course is a music video now we are covering the first and i believe only ova released by studio ghibli so far and it is a straight to dvd straight to blu-ray release of a how should i put it an animated picture gallery directed by and painted by primarily naohisa inoue so let me first introduce my fellow co-host. We have a cozy, small little round right here. So first of all, we have, uh, well, I'm going to name myself first, me, the host, Nyad. My pronouns are he, him. Um, then we have Max on, a, on returning since uh, Mononoke Hime when you met them for the first time. Hey, Max. Hey, I'm Max. Like, like Nyad said, I was the first time I was on Mononoke Hime. It's been a while, but hey. Also, my pronouns are nowadays they, them. And yeah, I'm kind of hyped to talk about this movie. <laughs> and then we have returning Voice Flower. Hello, it's good to be back. And uh, I'm Voice Flower. My pronouns are she, her. And we would be remiss if we did not uh, remark on the title of this OVA, which is Iblarjikan. True, true. Um, Iblad Jikan, which literally means Iblad time. Yes, Iblad is not a word that can be translated. That is supposedly the name of the world that Inoue Naohisa's uh, paintings circle around. And he himself and his art is no stranger to the Ghibli canon because we've already encountered him and we already talked a little bit about him back in the Whisper of the Heart cast. I mean, neither of you were there for that, but that's fine. Um, because their Inoue's paintings were used for the world of the story, if you remember. Because the 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 right. and I forgot story, her name. The one that Shizuku, she was writing. thank you. Yeah. yeah, Shizuku's story was visually represented in a later in the later half of the movie by using these kinds of paintings from uh, Inoue. And it was this really striving, surrealist, colorful world with like mm. Well, there, it's really hard to summarize, really, because there's so many unique and distinctive features about architecture and, you know, vegetation and the use of color in these things. So I guess, well, we, we should be taking it one by one. This thing, um, Ibla Jikan, was released in 2007. And it is basically written, directed, storyboarded, everything by now he's, uh, you know, himself basically in an attempt to collaborate with a few animators of Studio Ghibli to actually genuinely just make it a moving picture gallery of some of his paintings. Because between him and I guess mainly Miyazaki in the studio, there's been like a mutual sort of admiration. Not only is like Miyazaki's influence present on Ibla Jikan in so far as like if you watch the OVA, you can see a couple of flying islands here or there. And it uh, and it's the fact is that those are called Laputas. The flying islands in mm -hmm. Iblad are called Laputas. Because there's obviously like, yeah, some mutual respect to Miyazaki. But also Miyazaki basically personally enlisted Inoue to do the segment in Whisper of the Heart 12 years earlier. Because Miyazaki was looking at a picture gallery where Inoue's paintings were being displayed and decided that they are so good that he needs to buy one and put it in his office and also hire this man to, you know, get some more collaboration going. And this, and I think in the in the in between time, there was also a short in the Ghibli Museum directed by Inoue, which we, of course, can't see because we cannot go to Japan right now. <laughs> and it's very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and this is basically their third collaboration because... Here we have Inoue with the help of, and I guess his main co-conspirator here would be Kenichi Konishi, who is the animation director on this. And Kenichi Konishi, just to basically mention this person explicitly, has quite the 
uh, amazing career in anime. So, for one, he was the uh, uh, character designer and animation director on Tokyo Godfathers. On later, he would be character designer and animation director on Tale of Princess Kaguya, and that's a big feat mm. because being wow. the animation director on that movie is is a huge credit. I guess we're gonna talk about that more when we get to that podcast, but. Also on My Neighbors Day Amadas, also character designs animation director. Uh, as you can see, he's no stranger to, I guess, experimental animation, right? Because, right. yeah, it's like in this OVA, Ibla Jikan, we have like paintings where characters come to life, move around and then disappear in the background again. We have like machines and flying devices and islands and like elements of the screen that are emotional. All of it is like very, very unconventional. It's the same as it is basically in terms of being unconventional in My Neighbors the Amadas, which looks nothing like other anime, which looks like a sketch almost come to life. And Tale of Princess Kaguya, of course, like a painting, of, uh, like an old Japanese style ink painting, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess they get him because it's fascinating. Another thing that he's uh, uh, had a big influence on is Children of the Sea which is, of course, a movie that we will cover once we get to the post-Ghibli segment because uh, Shadow of the Th Sea is one of those movies that a lot of Ghibli stuff made after they had left Ghibli uh, to pursue their own projects. And it's like a big one where Kenichi Kunishi was character designer, chief animation director and unit director, which means basically that a large chunk of the movie was hand-directed by him. Uh, for movies that usually is what unit director means not the full director but like like an episode director for a movie where it means like an extended unit of the movie um, other noteworthy stuff is I guess uh, Hiromasa Yonobayashi who's a key animator here he, we will later encounter him in a couple of the movies he directed for Ghibli and of course Marion the Witch's Flower which will be another one of our post Ghibli movies um, and I guess Noteworthy as well, because what Ibla Jikan consists of is more than just the um, visual presentation. The second large element, because there's no dialogue or writing of any kind, is the music. So uh, the, the composer is called Ki Kiyonori Matsuo. And, well, I, I have no expertise on music, so I can't really speak to the kind of music that it is. But maybe voice, like, I think you had a couple of ideas, like, what, what the kind of music is going for here. Yeah, I mean... I. I am not familiar with any of uh, the artist's other work, but um, to me, it, it had a very low-key, uh, like, New Age fusion type feel, blending different styles of music together to kind of uh, create this, um, uh, well, in the in the film, it's, it's like a pastiche between the different um, uh, sections and it, trying to evoke different different moods tied to the kinds of landscapes that are being portrayed. Um, but it's all like really, uh, you know, musically, it's a lot of, uh, it's blend of acoustic and, and electronic, but all with a really uh, subdued um, uh, mood to it and uh, sort of uh, very calming energy. Yeah. And I noticed a couple of sounds that gave me very, tactile very local feeling for example i at one scene there was like extended mediterranean sound going on another scene there was like bagpipes going on so i guess i yeah. see where you get, what you mean when you say pastiche um and i think that fits wonderfully with what the paintings are going for because there we have a very organic blend of different architectural styles and it makes it hard to sort of localize the buildings you're seeing like they don't look like they're taking from a particular culture or particular time in history but like all Not of them quite. at once right yeah it's it's something where it's it's familiar but you can't quite put your finger on it it's it seems to have like various aesthetic uh, uh relations i think max you mentioned uh when we talked about it earlier the ecological brutalism the architectural style yeah, that's the the kind of massive um, um, cement walls, but it also has the the echo uh, echo feeling to it that it's a lot of green or in that case because it's pretty surreal the 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 colorful exterior to it and it's super interesting. But we also talked about it that it has some kind of solar punk aesthetics to it. 
Yeah, and I also, also super yeah, interesting. Also picked up on that. That's definitely solar punk. Um, I'm probably gonna put solar punk into the title for this because I don't know why, but like the first <laughs> episode of this podcast, uh, uh, the, on Nausicaa had biopunk in the title, and I checked the YouTube analytics, and funny enough, uh, biopunk is the search term that people most likely found the podcast with. So I guess there was a market for biopunk commentary. Let's hope yeah. solar punk is the same, because okay, let's just briefly go into solar punk because I think it like really yeah. neatly. So what solar punk as an aesthetic is, is basically a utopian vision of a urban and I guess, uh, uh, you know, architectural style, which is extremely interwoven with nature in a way where even the structure and the development of the city is sort of organic. So where you have like a vast array of like green spots and wooden constructions and cultures and influences all growing together in one city space, which doesn't look like a gray cement city or anything, but looks like a very green, very organic, very living place. And I definitely see a lot of this here. A, a lot of it is very open, very green. The sun is allowed to enter all these big houses and rooms. And um, as, I men as we mentioned earlier, the sort of cultural pastiche that is reflected in the architectural style is also very reminiscent of solar punk solar punk is often characterized by yeah. very i guess having the 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 uh, city's architecture and modern city being dominated by like some older uh mainly asian architectural styles but it's not limited to that but it's just a big part of the aesthetic to yeah paint utopian ecological communities that exist more in harmony with like both natural beauty as well as uh, nature as an ecological space yeah i think it's, it's really interesting um uh one of the more um sort of telling aspects of, of this in the, in the film is um is sort of like the infrastructure and, and methods of transportation which are all you know uh completely clean it seems like you know there's no uh, exhaust or anything there's these uh rail cars you know seemingly uh powered you know through electricity through the rails so you know it could be a solar power or some other kind of energy we never see anywhere in the in all of the paintings um like a smokestack or anything yeah. like that or industrial areas nothing like that we mm -mm. mainly see very beautiful sort of cities that are woven straight into a green and bustling, bustling landscape. And there's a lot of transportation going on, right? There's not an yes. absence of technology. There's a lot of flying machines and magical flying machines too. Uh, and like mm -hmm. little trains, streetcars, stuff like that. And it's sort of like a vision of a very, well, green, harmonious community that seamlessly blends with like a very chaotic nature. Yeah, but there is some, like, I feel there is some, like, domestication of the nature, right? It, like, in, in one section in particular, there is this, uh, there are, uh, there's, a, there's a greenhouse or a couple greenhouses. Um, but then the the house or the cabin itself is, is surrounded by, um, by a larger, you know, more wild, huge woods and and forests and things like that so it's like within nature you find these pockets of civilization and those you know within the civilization you 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 have some uh you know uh harmony with with nature within it so the impression yeah. i got is that instead of this seems to be more a world where instead of uh making nature conform to city and urban development we have Made, then it done it a different way around. Like nature pre-exists right. and we kind of fit civilization into nature as it already exists. Mm -hmm. Because either buildings look like they naturally grew out of the environment then or they're like carefully put in like the, the, the positions that were afforded to it by nature. Like everything looks like it has grown or like was always structured like this or most of it is, uh, uh, I guess, which gives us this very organic feel to the architecture. Yeah, I I I sort of agree, but I also like I I definitely think that that is part of what it's supposed to evoke. But it's sort of this paradox because there are these really 
you know, there's lots of like conf- complex infrastructure going on here. We have these these rails that extend through the sky and in between. So there's there is a sort of engineering, like human engineering, you know, at play here in a way that uh, if if it had if it uh, if the if the civilization doesn't um, you know interfere with nature, it's it's because of like a very meticulous you know concern by by the people of this world. You know, yeah. That's that's kind of how I read it. It's not necessarily oh, it just naturally and easily organically became this way, but that uh, the the you know the people of this world like really value this kind of harmonious. Um, existence with nature that's kind of how i read it of course it's all very abstract so i don't yeah i I guess i guess it's worth mentioning that this is these are all paintings by a surrealist painter and uh, you know inoue is a like a professor at some arts college in japan like a very renowned person who's been working on these paintings since the 80s and they were all centered in this world of iblad so there's not only like an extensive canon of like different paintings depicting this world but also of course it being surrealism is um well odd (laughs) to say the least so we we are kind of yeah yeah, I think that it 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 does take a lot from um like the surrealist school, but it's not it's not supposed to be simply a dream, right? It's supposed to be a grounded place that feels familiar. Um I guess it's worth mentioning here that it's, you know, um that the the scenery uh, and uh, you know, architecture and and uh sort of vibe of the of these paintings was inspired by um you know as like real real life childhood home right yeah yep um what's the city called oh i forgot already <laughs> Takatsu- you- takatsuki city and suita city in osaka prefecture yeah and in osaka in osaka yeah um and i guess you're right uh, so one thing especially like the point that you made that it's like feels familiar that is one thing that Miyazaki has himself commented on about what he likes about the paintings by Inoue and he's explained a concept he calls the Iblad eyes which doesn't mean like anything else but you look at something but you look at it from a new perspective so he uses the example of a gas station at night or convenience store at night Uh, if you're just looking at it regularly like a convenience store at night is like very mundane and dull and yeah you've seen it before whatever but if you look with the Iblad eyes, he says, suddenly you notice, wow, it is like lighting up the night and it's like this mysterious place uh, giving up, giving out fantastic light rays in the night and it's like really impressive. And his admiration for Inoue, I guess, comes from the fact that Inoue takes like cities and real places that inspire him and makes them fantastic with this uh, ability to bring out the fantastic in all in these sceneries and landscapes. Yeah, in mundane things. And it is definitely just like, because this entire OVA, I guess if we're trying to give it like a narrative or progression, we are coming from a very rural area, like a hometown. We're moving towards the city and experiencing all kinds of locations and scenes in and around the city. And then we're moving back to the hometown by the end of it, returning home, basically. And on that journey, we're just experiencing all kinds of marbles uh marbles marvels uh for what would be for the characters that we're seeing moving in and out of these sceneries be very everyday occurrences you could technically say that's like a whole life journey you're starting as a young child in in this small rural area grows up goes into the biggest cities like this one scene has a kind of harbor city where he probably works, and then he gets out, and then he is move, move, he's moving back to his hometown, this, this little uh, village, and he's living there until the rest of his life. And yeah, I think that's a good point. Like uh, th- this, the the imagery, uh, both of like these rural pastoral communities and also the city, um, metropolitan and commercial areas, they, they kind of evoke this. It's the setting of everyday life, right? It's not a complete it's not an epic right it's it's very 
every day. And you can easily imagine stories of just normal, everyday people going about their everyday lives and, uh, you know, growing up um, and, uh, and and exploring these places, uh, but in a way that is very, uh, very grounded, very, very true to real people. And... I guess what, this also recalls something that Inoue himself has said about it. Uh, when asked what is Iblad, he said, a piece of a distant day that I can't remember. I'm sure it will be a nostalgic day to come. So hmm. there's a vision of the future that is at the same nostalgic, uh, at the same time nostalgic. And I guess that's what we are like uh, 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 getting back at. And which I also think why it compares so well to Miyazaki's canon. Because there we often talk with Miyazaki's movies about how there's sort of a sense of loss and a desire to return to a more uh, harmonious and peaceful way of engaging with the world, with nature especially. But like a sense mm. that this is uh, in the current day being taken away, being lost. What Inoue has here is a future to come which feels nostalgic. So we're restoring something from the past, some kind of uh, a peace quiet tranquility harmony like some natural uh how should i put it uh synergy or synthesis yes and yeah. it feels nostalgic even though there's a vision for a future which which is how we get back to the solar punk aesthetics of utopianism right it is supposed to be a future that enables humans to return to a state more in line with nature um as in not our current mode of exploitative geologies and the anthropocentric worldview of destruction of resources at, for our own purposes, but a world in which the fabric of nature and civilization are extremely intertwined and existing in a way very different from, I guess, what it is currently. Mm. So it is very much a utopian vision in that way. But also like... I suppose because of like the Iblad eyes, right? It's an invitation to view the world like that. Right. I definitely think so. I think that it's um uh it's important that the the only two recurring characters in in this um little OVA uh which occur in in multiple of uh you know his paintings um are this uh, this young boy uh, or an adolescent and and a girl, and um, and they kind of go uh, from their rural community uh, that's very low to the ground, um, with with you know buildings that are you know one one story or two, uh, and they they sort of go out and explore the bigger city. Um, that uh that has more verticality and um and they uh the 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 young adolescent boy like uh takes his painting tools and and goes and sketches a a uh, a landscape uh where there's you know buildings along a a hill and and then the, the girl goes and plays by um by taking her, you know, magical ball that boomerangs back to her and playing catch with it, yeah. <laughs> and then and then, um, you know, later on, uh, getting on a uh, a uh, a zeppelin that grew out of a flower and uh, and transporting herself by entering a like some kind of interdimensional uh, p uh, portal that that goes back to the countryside. So it's. Uh, yeah, it's um, you know, through the eyes of children, this is like a place to explore, but it's also very much, you know, it's home, but also uh, provides like a lot of um, a lot of places for exploration because, um, I think one of the key things with you know this the solar punk aesthetic here is that because it's so interwoven with nature, and and. Uh, you know, has has sort of grown within the confines of what nature has allowed. Like there are all of these really interesting, unique little pockets of uh, of civilization. It's not it's not like this, you know, uh, monotonous, uh, hegemonic sort of um, you know city. Yeah, it's uh, it has a lot of different 
uh, it has a lot of character and, and very different feelings in different areas. Um, I don't know that that kind of to me it it just occurred to me, but yeah, it definitely has. And I also liked your focus on through the eyes of the children and the boy goes painting uh, because that is, I think, mirroring. So I guess like if we have a person painting in the painting, we should ask, okay, what does the painter feel about his paintings? How does he go about painting? And I think there's a great overlap because um, on his website, there's like a part where Inoue documents like, how do I even come up with these paintings? And he, sa he says, well, I start out by putting random colorful splotches onto a canvas and then seeing if I can see shapes emerge. And I don't know what I'm going to paint when I start painting. So you just see him like paint putting splotches there. He's like, these splotches that I put here, like they form it. This looks like it could be a restaurant. Then he will just go and turn the already <laughs> existing colorful splotches on the canvas into this restaurant, into this uh, uh, landscape with backgrounds and, 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 you know, everything. This is why a lot of these paintings are so intensely colorful. Of course, he'll paint over a lot of the yeah. color that he'll uh, at first put on there. But like the idea is that he puts a very chaotic, very organic, very grown sort of uh, 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 randomness into it and then carves sort of the buildings, the structures, the people that he sees out of that what already is there. And it's very, wow. I, I guess I keep repeating the word organic, but it's really like seeing a pattern in the chaoticness of the color and then building from that and turning that into his paintings. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, uh, I, I, I think that's why we get this feeling that the, you know, the architecture and, and these, um, you know, artifacts of, of human civilization sort of grow, you know, within the, within the world of Ibarja Khan, they are uh, sort of fitting into the negative space of nature, right? They're not, they're not trying to, inf it's not infringing on the natural spaces, but existing, coexisting with pre, you know, with what was there and, and not taking away from any of those natural spaces. And in, in, in a way, like, you know, as technique, uh, is the same. It's it, you know he starts off with with chaos. You know, the, you know. Whereas you know chaos can be nature. There's chaos in nature, but then you sort of find the pockets where humanity can fit. Or in you know the case of his technique, you know, find the pockets where structures and people will fit into the chaos that is already there. Yeah, and this really comes full circle with all the things we've discussed so far, right? It's like a ecological utopia where we humans find a place a niche to exist within nature and with nature around it we have the ear blood eyes which will allow you to see something like maybe something chaotic such as color splotches and you interpret them and you can see them differently and find the beauty that lies in them and like all of these things like it all like co coalesces around this te technique he even uses to make these worlds and it speaks really of a sort of um randomness of beauty in this sense i guess right because he really just urges his art urges us to look at the world in a different way to see blood right that's basically yeah. what, what he wants of us and he's showing us his own iblard eyes you know yeah <laughs> i really yeah the, on on the wiki for this uh for for for, for the little ova and i i really like there's a little blurb where um you know, it describes how there's this technology or is a magic stone from um, from the world of Iblard that is called a solma, and it allows the the holder to uh, project onto it a um, an image of what's in their own mind. Yeah. Um, and he says that you know it also like it's not only special to the world of Iblard. It's not some fantastic thing. It's you know it says no. You know the pictures that I paint are my solma, uh, which which express the view of of Iblard, which which comes from my mind, yeah, or his mind rather. <laughs> that, that that's really a, a, I guess a wonderful way to approach it. And I think a way why Miyazaki resonates so much with this art because he resonates with it enough to put a painting of this in his own office um, is because he really approaches animation in a very similar way. He often explains how he 
animates scene by scene rather than planning out a whole movie ahead of time where he just really takes a scene and as he is animating it, it grows in front of him. Like, yeah, I need Chihiro stumbling down the steps and then with this and this and this. <laughs> and it's all very uh, organic too because in making a scene, it develops as he empath empathizes and as it like as he lets it grow, which is also, I guess, why his movies tend to uh, be a nightmare to produce for Toshio Suzuki, who wants him to stay on time and not make five-hour movies. <laughs> 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 um, and I guess this is why it's such a wonderful collaboration between these well, Miyazaki has not worked on this. Uh, I keep bringing up Miyazaki because, of course, we rightfully conflate him as kind of like the brain and mind and soul of Ghibli alongside a few other people like Takahara and Suzuki. But, yeah, he got him basically, he basically got Inoue to do this project with Ghibli. And, well, we're looking at the result and it's nice. It is a very, let's just say it like this, it's a very experimental little short film. It's like really a picture gallery where we've taken... Uh, a few of the modern CG and animation techniques that Ghibli has to offer to really bring paintings, and these paintings pre-exist the OVA right there, paintings selected by Inoue to be turned into animation, where we have like gentle CG to make the water glisten, and we take elements of the background, like floating islands and flying machines, and we apply some heavy parallax scrolling in order to have them float around and sometimes animated characters yeah. are injected where we have like them gently moving through the scene and all yeah, sorts and those, of little things yeah the, the i really like the very the brief and sparse character animation is all really charming there's there's a lot of uh um I don't know, just the way they move. I mean, it's, I mean, one can talk about, oh, the way that, you know, Ghibli characters move, like, you know, all day, like, but uh, in this, even in this uh, little, little film where the animation really is not what is, um, you know, the, the star of the show, it still uh, has this very grounded, real feeling to it. You know, there's like one little, scene in which uh, a girl or a woman is is like picking flowers from um from a hedge or something like that and then a girl you know waves at her and runs up and the way she runs is just like very much like in the way a, an excited little girl would run and um yeah i just liked it <laughs> yeah it, it is a nice little ova you know i, I i'm feeling like we are covering we've already covered quite quite a bit of ground on this one i'm gonna to have to say like it is a mood piece it is a very experimental short film and you're if you're dear listener uh looking to really engage this it's literally just sit down and like watch it a few times put on the music sit back and then let your eyes wander across your blood let you know show you what he wants you to see and you know very neat i haven't seen anything like this like where you take pictures and you curate them with music and animation to really bring them to life and it's a neat experience so i would definitely recommend checking it out for anyone who's maybe someone is just listening to these podcasts without having seen the thing in question i don't know <laughs> i don't know if that happens let us know in the comments down below <laughs> well okay if, if either of you feel like we can still cover something here. I would otherwise just say, you know, everyone should just go and watch this. It's it's a nice little thing. Yeah, I agree. Yep, same. Okay, then this time, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know yet. Maybe, uh, uh, because we have like a meme uh, on the Narcissist here that we tend to mm. do episodes that are longer than the original thing. We might be doing this <laughs> again here, but just by like one or two minutes. So. Yeah. I guess we'll see after editing. I don't know yet. But um it's close enough. <laughs> it's close enough. Yeah. Um okay, so the next thing we're going to cover on the Nausicaa's is I think it's going to be Ponyo, right? Oh, I'm, I'm I'm I don't have it pulled up. I'm stretching for time, so we had to hit the numbers again. Uh, so we hit the numbers again. No, it's Ponyo. It's Ponyo. <laughs> we're going back to Miyazaki. Great. It's obviously going to be a big one again because every Miyazaki movie is a big one. Uh Fortunately or unfortunately, there isn't so many Miyazaki movies left. So let's see how much uh, uh, 
how many stressful research periods will come out of this. So um, other than that, we have the regular things to shout out. Uh, uh, the Discord server, which you can find in the description. We have a Patreon, uh, uh, which you can use to support us hosting this podcast. And, you know, we're soon hitting that mark where the hosting cost costs are going to be covered by <laughs> the Patreon money we get. So let's see if we can maybe get it at some point. That would be nice. <laughs> and... Yeah. Um, other than that, I think we are going to check out and see you all in the next one. Bye. Bye. Bye.